Good morning and welcome to St. John's First Letter. Here we are. Look at this. We've made it to chapter 4. We're going to really ask the Lord to speak today. Let's bow our heads. Father above, you give us your holy word and your own spirit to open and unpack it for us and speak to us with it, um, calling us to trust you and to let you clear us of that selfish nature within that tries to take the center. We ask you today, speak. We ask you, uh, help us to hear what you've used St. Paul to St. John to say, and we pray that it would be to our benefit that we might, we might be the ones that you work in and through to bring your love, not just to us, uh, but through us to those around. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, very good. Yes. John, uh, how, where are we? Let's draw a great big triangle here because John, so far in, in four chapters, has been teaching us of the life of the Trinity, which is a life of love, the life and love of God. And he has been, he has been inviting us to share, we're gonna make a big. Maybe could we get Father? We got we got Holy Spirit. We'll put the Holy Spirit over here. And this this of course is gonna be the Son that in and through the flesh of Jesus, uh, he is inviting and calling us to participate. Let's put let's put let's put you here. Although we, it, this is certainly not just a singular situation. Um, this we could put a whole bunch of other people here, you know, all around. We're going to talk about that, but uh, he is saying, come. God is making an invitation through the Son that we might share in God's life. Another word for this is, is fellowship. Um, another word for this is sacrament. Uh, that we've been noticing here that the sacramental connection of the word, the word is being, the word or the invitation or the message is being spoken and calling us to participate in the life and, and have fellowship with the Trinity. But the question, the big question would be, well, how? Uh, because the reality is, sinners, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. And, and a bunch of, a lot of darkness down here, if you, if you catch my drift. And, and the answer has been, the answer has been repentance and, and forgiveness. That is to say that God has granted and is inviting us to tell the full truth about our darkness, whatever it might be, whatever, whatever sins, whatever shortcomings, all the things you're afraid of even to tell yourself. God's saying, I want to hear them. I want, I invite you to bring them to me and I'll forgive and cleanse you of all of it. This, this, um, this repentance and forgiveness has had a couple other uh, terms so far in, in in the first three chapters. One is to practice righteousness. What does it mean? It means to repent and be forgiven. Uh, another one is to abide in God. And another one is to walk with him. These are all just descriptions of um, turning to him in full honest truth about all your shortcomings and letting him cleanse and cleanse and forgive and clean you so that you might actually be able to be in the life and the love and the fellowship, receiving it there in the sacrament. We're talking about the sacrament of the altar, the body and blood of Jesus in and through the flesh. So here we go. Uh, this you've, we've realized, yes, this now has us in a cycle where, uh, wait a minute, I did it the wrong way. Well, no problem. Uh, we'll draw it like this where what we do is Christians are re re repenting, they're telling the full truth, they're trusting and receiving the cleansing and the forgiveness by faith, and then of course that, the fruit, that makes, creates fruit, this re fruit of repentance, which is love for those nearby. Now, just in case you think you can make up what it means to love people, uh, in his letter so far, John has told us, really, the chief thing this means is forgiving them. Oh, 
now loving them is hard all of a sudden. Yeah, because forgiveness is the highest expression of love that there is. It's, it's one thing to you know, help some old lady across the street, and it's another to forgive that person that's hurt you and that you really meditate on all the things they've done wrong to you. This is love, the love of God. We're going to talk about that more, I'm sure, today here too. But the other one, can't just make up what love means, God tells us, uh, is insisting on the truth. Namely, that this is true and that this is the only loving way. Because only in repentance and forgiveness, where we tell the full truth and then God cleanses us because of his grace and mercy, only there can we actually have fellowship with these other people. Only there can the devil have no access in. He, see, the, the devil can't break this. What does he do? He says, oh, you're a sinner. Well, yeah, I know. I told the truth about that in repentance to God. And he, forgive me. Oh, uh, you know, something else. Like, he can't get into this. This is foolproof. And the very last thing we heard there at the end of chapter 3 was that God has actually granted us his own spirit for this. He's given us the Holy Spirit so that we might stay in this cycle. Because the moment that you try and love, forgive and insist on the truth with your brother, you fail. And so guess what happens? You go back into repentance and forgiveness, and this is how you are kept uh, in this way. Lutherans call it law and gospel. At least that's the expression. That's how God preaches it to us. And the Holy Spirit within us keeps us in this cycle. Thank you, John! for doing that, uh, or for re revealing that to us in your letter. Now what we're going to do is we're going to see him explain a bit more of that as we go into chapter 4. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. All right, now I want you to, I'm going to draw this because this is kind of funny. If um, we draw like a, like a desk here, you know, and uh, when I was in school, uh, we sat at desks like this when we took tests, right? We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna test. Um, uh, you can picture this ghost. Ooh, uh, is is this what he means when he says test the spirits? That we're gonna we're gonna put the test right there on the pa on the on the table. Give him a pencil, right? And then we're gonna we're gonna okay, ghost. Okay, ghost, come on over here. There's, there's, I don't know, this desk turned out pretty bad. Here, let's make a chair so that it looks proper. The, okay, ghost, come on over here, write this test. No, obviously not. This is not what, this is not what John means when he says test the spirits. Who are, who are these spirits? Who are the spirits? Well, he tells us, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. Prophets, we're talking about preachers. This is who you are to test. Don't just believe them because they say the name Jesus or they, they sound like they are on the side of good. The false prophets do that, John tells us. They're in the church. And in chapter 2, he said they've come, they've come out from us, the apostles, right? So there's these preachers, even, at, even in John's day, who've got all these false teachings about Jesus. And you, dear one, are not to believe them all. You're supposed to be careful which preachers you listen to, and you're supposed to test them. We're going to talk about that, because the question is, well, <laughs> I can't call that spirit into the dust to do... How do I test a, a preacher? He's going to tell us. He's going to, he's going to tell us. Don't worry. But so far, he has told us some things in the other chapters. In chapter 2, he said, if they depart apostolic teaching, and then... Another one was that if they deny Father and Son, that Jesus is the Christ. I mean, if, if, these, if these things are happening, um, no chance. Now, in chapter 1, and this one's probably going to be important because you actually hear this in parts of the Christian church sometimes. If we say we have no sin, say we have, there are, um, there are actual church bodies who teach that you somehow make it to this point where you don't need repentance Where's my repentance again? Right here. That this, that this no longer becomes the way you and God are united and having fellowship and that God's active in you. No, no. That somehow there's this other thing. So this, be careful. If they say, 
If there's anybody saying, oh, you have no sin, then guess what? They are, they are, not, don't listen to that, test that spirit, don't listen. Now, another one in chapter one, he said, was watch out if they walk in darkness. And you and I might think, well, that means you're, you're easily going to, that, that's darkness, by the way. Uh, what does this mean? If, what, what this means is that if the center, here, I'll put it, I'll show you this way. Walking in dark, walking with God was this. So walking in darkness is when the center of Everything that's happening in church is not exclusively repentance and the forgiveness of sins. That daily, all the time, you're confessing sin and being forgiven. You're, you're in this cycle. Guess what? That is not, that is, test that preacher, that, that's not a good preacher. Don't go to those churches. If the church is just teaching you how to be a good Christian, or if it's teaching you how the church needs to do certain things in the world, this repentance and the forgiveness of sins. That's what John has taught us. Um, and the final one, the final one has to do in, in chapter one, he also said, um, those that hate our, hate their brother. Well, what, what does that mean? It just, we're talking about forgiveness. If you don't desire forgiveness for everyone, or if the preacher is kind of writing off people and not desiring forgiveness for all people, guess what? They are not. They are not of God. Um, so now he's going to add to that. Let's take a look here. Okay, he's he's trying to teach us uh, the difference between the. I'll show you. Look, I'll I'll, I'll I'll show you the ending. By this we know the spirit of truth. And the spirit of error. This is what he's trying to teach you right now in this little section. Okay, so so far we've we've, we've reviewed those things that he said so far, but he's going to give us a little bit more to deal with here, and it's going to blow your mind. Are you ready? Verse two. By this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit. Remember that's a preacher. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and is now in the world already. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them, these, these false preachers. Okay, For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world. Therefore, they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this, we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Awesome. John adds to the criteria that he's already given us right here, where he says, every preacher that confesses that Jesus has come in the flesh is from God. Let's make sure we got that. Now, I want to show you something. Has come. It does not say did come as if like, you know, before it happened. No. Has come. Is present here with us in the flesh. This takes us back to the very first words of his letter. Do you remember those words? From chapter 1. We have heard. We have seen with our eyes. We have looked upon and touched with our hands even the word of life. He's talking about the Lord's Supper. He's talking about the sacrament. Communion. What do we sing at the end of it? What after we commune? Here, let's put a little, put a little blood in there. What, what, do we, what do we sing? My own eyes have seen thy salvation. When did my eyes see the salvation of God? Um, LSB 631. Here, O oh my Lord, I see thee face to face. Here would I touch and handle things unseen. Here grasp with firmer hand the eternal grace and all my weariness upon thee lean. We are not talking about some sort of spiritual only situation here. There is one place where John 
is, in, is impressing upon his readers that the Lord has you and I connected to the life of God. Right? Take a look at this. We are talking about fellowship with Father and Son. Our living connection, because this is eternal life. Let's put the word eternal here. Eternal life. Our living connection to this trinity is the flesh of Jesus. Right? This is given for you. Yes, certainly, as payment on the cross. But here John is emphasizing that it's given for your abiding fellowship. For your participation, you're being ruled by the life of God so that it flows down into you. How central and important is this to John? He's saying, this must be the preaching of the preacher. The only, the preacher that comes from God confesses that Jesus has come in the flesh. And otherwise, well, at least in those situations, they're not speaking for God. Those who deny the real presence of the Lord's Supper are not speaking for God at that time. They're speaking a worldly message. They're against Christ. They're, where's that word? They're anti-Christ because they're trying to interfere and to keep the life of Christ from reaching those Christ wants to give it to. So that he can hold them in that New Testament. This is the New Testament. Yes, thankfully, I, I know, I know you're, you're worried. What about all the churches that don't, don't worry. Look, there's word, there's word and sacrament. Okay, so God is saving countless Christians with his word of grace. That's true. Despite all the false teachers who deny the body and blood of Jesus and his holy supper. But let's be clear. John is teaching us. That teaching that denies the flesh isn't apostolic. The message, in fact, let's be honest. Let's draw the word right here. The message is an invitation into the fellowship. That's what it is. That's what the, what the word is. The word is calling us into the life of the Trinity. It, God wants communion with you, with you. This is the message, right? It takes us all the way back to the tree. There, let's put that, on, that tree in there, right? We got our tree. Um, what was the fruit for? What, what was all that about? That was about communion. That was about us being united to God. And to suggest that that's not the, the, the end goal of this. That we have to cut. We're going to cut off the, the sacrament. What, what do you, what's happening here? So don't worry. The apostolic teaching is true to you. It, the word is inviting you into fellowship. Into the presence. Into the life. Into the love. And... We're going to see, watch how, when we, when we get to the next session, watch. that John is actually going to say, the, having and receiving that life and love from God is going to change you and the people that you interact with. So if you want to make a difference in this world, repent and believe and receive this. Get connected to the supper. So look, um, I think that's even, is that just right? Ah, oh, no, it's not. Verse 4. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them, all those preachers. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Now, let's, let's draw this. This is, this is the reality that John is, is describing to you. you. You know how this works. This is total darkness. This is the world around you, right? The one, because the one in the world is like the devil, right? So the one who is in the world. So the Antichrist and all the false, all the falsehood, all the darkness, all the utter, you know, scary mess that you're constantly around. And there's you, little you, little child. And you're thinking, am I done? No. He's, look at this verse. You have overcome the darkness. Why? I'm going to make, make this, he who is in you, here you are, in the midst of this darkness, and in you, I should have made this body a little bigger, so you could see here, is, is that, what spirit, see, comparing spirits here, the spirit of error all around, and the spirit of truth. So we're talking about the Holy Spirit here. John is teaching us that the spirit of God 
The word and spirit are in you here. That's what he said in chapter three. He's given the spirit to you. God has given his spirit to keep you in the faith and in the fellowship. He keeps you in, in that cycle of repentance and forgiveness. And this is the Holy Spirit's work in you so that you are constantly protected from this darkness. All around. Don't be afraid of it. It can't harm you. The, the, it might get your flesh. Don't worry about that. Even, even in that, God's Spirit will have you experience the power of Christ by repentance and forgiveness. You know that verse, when I am weak, that I am strong? That's 2 Corinthians 12.10. It's difficult to be weak. It's difficult to have this all around you. You, you. you just wish God did it differently. You know, you just wish, well, he just, he just got rid of all that. No, he's going to preserve you right where you are. Don't move. Stand firm. This is just what we constantly hear in every example on all the scriptures. You don't have to move at all. Now, this is what's really interesting. Look at this. We haven't acknowledged this enough, I, I think. The spirit of error. There is an actual demon behind false teaching. It's not just some, like, inanimate moving thing. No, there is, there is a... There is someone poking and prodding this false teaching along. Mm -mm -mm. Okay, all the, all of these false teachings, or anything that that anything that Paul, John's warned us against, and, and particularly here, the, the idea that Jesus is not present with us in the flesh. Um, there is a demon that that is is um, concerned about that and trying to trying to interfere, trying to trying to trying to get in the way of this cycle. Okay, now, uh, Paul tells us, well, think of this. He tells us sacrifices are offered to demons. That's in uh, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 20, there, right? And he, notice again that this is in discussion of communion or fellowship. These evil spirits, these demons, they absolutely, they want to end a certain kind of fellowship, Right? And they want to establish another kind of fellowship. Okay, that this these spirits aren't just gonna, they're not just trying to stop one fellowship. They want to make a make a, their own fake one. And so you need you you and I need to look at this. We need to know, and we do know. This is how you can tell, John says. Listen to the apostles. They will guide you. Alright? Now, beloved, he's gonna talk about the fellowship. Look at this. He's gonna talk about this. Let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. And this, the love of God, was manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world, so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. This is a repeat. This is a summary. Thank you, John, for just hammering the same thing over and over and over again. Where can I draw this? Where, um, God is love. Right? We're talking about the life, this life of love. We're talking about what that, that we already did this picture, but I'm going to do it again in a way with these words here so that you can see this. Now that love, we're told, look at this. John is encouraging the fellowship loving one another, this forgiving, insisting on the truth love, right? Um, this is the fellowship. This is the, the way that the, that the fellowship manifests, okay? Love is from God. Here it is. I should put that. God's love from the, from the center of the Trinity. God, it's from him. It's moving this way, okay? Here comes the love from God. Whoever has been born of God and knows God um, is someone that is on the receiving end of God's love, right? So if God's love has reached you, then guess what? Um, you're, I love how they describe it as being born and knowing him. So here comes the love. 
Now, anyone uh, who does not love, well, doesn't know God because that, 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 wouldn't, that wouldn't work. But this is the key verse, is verse 9. And this is very important. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us. How, how was this love made manifest? God sent his only son into the world so that, the, that, that we might live through him. So there's the life again, right? We're talking about the flesh of Jesus Christ. There he is. God sent and manifested his love in Jesus. And that you and I live, we have access to the life through this love that has come out and that is in the flesh of Christ. He is the connecting point. And I want to really hammer this. Look at this. And this is love. Not that we have loved God. Not our love. We're talking about God's love. Not our love. This is difficult. Okay? I agree. God's love is working in and through the believer. Okay? God's love, not our love. And this is very hard to, to deal with. And we're going to talk about that. We need to talk about how hard that is to deal with. Let's, let's be honest. Okay? Um, the love of God is flowing. It's flowing right down into you, and the Lord wants it to flow out to one another, right? To the others in that fellowship, okay? So that you do not become the stopping point of God's love, but that we let it flow, have its way with us, desire it for others, and let it reach them through us. We desire that God's love is perfected in us. That's what it says here. Perfected in us. God abides in us and his love is perfected in us along the way. Yes. This is what we pray in the Lord's Prayer when we say, forgive us our trespasses as we, as we forgive those who trespass against us, right? Let your love flow, Father. God's, look, you see what's happening. And this is why it's hard. This is why we have to talk about it. God's love is replacing our love. The selfless love of God is replacing our self-focused love and our selfless love. Self-love um, by, by fellowship with him. And, and this is how it's happening. He's replacing this with his love. Now, you and I have, listen, okay, I want you to ask yourself this. This is really important. Why is it difficult to set aside our love, to make room for God's love? This is a very important question. Did you, I mean, had, had you even considered this before? That, that really, there is, there is a battle the, the real battle in all the world is whether or not whether or not I'm, I'm going to let God's love rule me and flow through me and, and it'll be him and his love and his glory or no my love I want it to be my love because then I get the glory people know I love them This, this is a hard thing to face. That the Christian is trying to allow God's love to flow such that other people are on the receiving end of his love and not our love. We need to get out of the way. This is what John is encouraging us to do. And yes, what, what does God give us when we struggle with this? Because this is hard, right? Guess what he gives us? He gives us that cycle. He's just, the Holy Spirit is just turning 
the screw. What do we do after our love fails? We tell them the truth. We say, I haven't let your love have its way with me and my love for others has failed. And he forgives us again and cleanses us. He just keeps us in that cycle. And by this, uh, more and more of his love and less and less of ours is flowing out to the people around us. Thanks be to God. It is impenetrable. This cycle, this way. Where's my other picture of this? This repentance. It is impenetrable because it wins. God's love wins. It will clear you. It will change you. It will use you. You will glorify him even in how he does that. And others will benefit. And this is the way it works. This is the kingdom. It is grace-filled. It is merciful. It is forgiving. And it is full of God's love. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for the, your apostle, for John and for his faithfulness in describing this and laying this out and telling us about this. Thank you that you, uh, at the Father's bidding, came here and made yourself the connection point with us, that you, by your death on the cross and resurrection from the dead, have now secured the way of repentance and faith, the way of telling the full truth about everything that I am to you, that you can cleanse me of it and then create and make love grow for the people around me. I praise you for this. And I ask you to do it more and more. I ask you to help me test the spirits, to clear away even those that would speak in ways that don't focus me on this, that don't focus me on that connection, that flesh connection I have with you in the supper. Do all these things by your own spirit. You promise you're doing this and you promise that you're, you're greater uh, than the one who's in the world. We leave all the petitions that you would stir in us before your throne of grace now also. Hear them and act. We ask this in your holy name. Amen. Okay. Wow. Thanks be to God. I hope that that gives you some real meat, some real thinking. Do some meditating on this idea and pray more about it. I'll see you next time.